All right. Now's the point where you've got to listen very closely because mine up here is not going to look the same. So I'm recording this for my other virtual people too. So I'm doing it in two computers at the same time. So I'll be a little slow. I need you to be on your Google Drive. Okay. And I need you to also go to Canvas, just to the home page. So get there first, and then I'll show you what you're going to do. Okay, are we all there? Okay. So, um, you, in person, you have your notes on paper, which is actually what I want you to do on paper because writing, you learn better. Um, you are actually going to turn in your notes for each unit. You're going to prove to me that you did them. You're going to take a picture of them and upload them to Canvas. Um, you'll notice throughout that some of them are filled in, some of them are not. The fill in the blank notes you will turn in. I'll see that you've completed them. The ones that are already filled in, you'll kind of write me a summary, a short summary of the main points and turn that in. I'll explain it before we do each one. Um, virtual people, you have to type in yours to, it's kind of like follow along with the lecture and fill in the blank and you'll type into it. Everything should be a doc. So you can type in, but in the event that we go red or you lose your notes or whatever, you're going to have it virtually also. Okay. So, um, if you go to our homepage, first of all, I want to point out this, this tech help. If you click on this, it'll ask you to make a copy, which I would recommend you do. And it tells you how to do all the different things that we went over. So if you ever get stuck, and you can't figure out how to do something, you can go here, okay? Uh, you just have to read the instructions. Okay, so what we're gonna do, remember, so remember we have it all set up through topics, so we can click on the topic and it will take us there. But to find everything, because there's so much in this class, we have to go down and find, um, we're gonna do slide three, what are you looking for? So the what are you looking for slide is going to have our exams, our study guides, our notes, just basic things that we need to find. So click right there. So we're going to find your notes to download. So where do you think you click? Notes. Yeah, notes. So click on it. It's going to take it a minute to get there. Okay. When you click on this link, sometimes, most of the time, it's going to give you like this sad face saying it didn't connect. If you click up here in this gray bar, click on the text in white, it's going to upload, um, open it for you. So um, it's going to ask if you want to make a copy. Yes, you do. So you're going to make a copy, make a copy. Is anyone lost so far? Okay. What little light square do you hit to make the sign face go away? Uh, up in the gray bar, mm -hmm. do you see where it says notes in white? Yes. Click right there. Okay, this is where mine's going to look a little different, so I need you to listen. Um, when you get here, you're going to click File. download okay and you're going to download it as a doc as a doc a word microsoft word and see on my pc it's not going to let me do that so that's why i need to tell you okay file download word and stop right there. Let me see. Okay. 
So it's going to make you sign in. Okay, sign in to with your not schools. Hi, baby. Okay, what's your all right so after you've downloaded go to your google drive and pull up your folder that you made for this class Okay, so go to Drive and go to your rehab folder that you made. Go ahead and click on it like you're opening it. So to add these in here, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to New, File, Upload. See, mine's going to look different now. And then there should be an option somewhere on there for you to select downloads. Okay. And then you, if you click on downloads, you should see it. It's, a, it's called copy of rehab binder. Click on it and add it. And mine looks different up here too, but... And then that will add it to your folder. On your notes, you have on page seven, you have a, it's blue. It's like a vocab list. So it kind of have given you some words that in, in the event that you don't know what they mean, um, you can, you can look them up. So we're going to watch this video on aphasia. Virtual people, you'll have to go to present mode and click on it. But this gives us a really good idea about what aphasia is. And then if you had to describe aphasia, what would you say it is after watching that video? You can just, you can just shout it out. I don't care. The inability to understand words. Okay. So. So I know it's like the rocks region of the brain that does the words and stuff like that. Um. Does sign language fall in the same area? Like, would they be able to understand sign language because it uses visual? So there's a Broca's and there's a Wernicke's area. One does production of speech. One does interpretation of speech. So that's a really good question. Um, with sign language, so this not like you're not producing speech and you're not hearing it. You are interpreting different types of signs. So mm -hmm. I would almost think that that would be a different area of the brain, like repetitive motor movements. Yeah. Like, I would think. Or it, would, it also is using like parts that don't, like it said, that, that interprets like imagery. And things. So, yeah, because she was signing. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was weird that she would like sign a little bit, but then use pictures and words and stuff. Yeah, so that's a really good question. That's what I would think, because she's not actually producing speech. So it could be a lot of different things. It could be they can't read, they can't write, um, they can't speak, they can't hear, they hear that garbled language. It could be one, it could be all. Okay, all of those fall under the blanket of aphasia. Um, what type of patients do you think would have aphasia? Okay, stroke, okay. Do you think it's limited to just stroke or? No. Um, a lot of stroke patients end up with it. Um, but any sort of head injury, um, traumatic brain injury, brain damage could potentially end up with aphasia. So some things that they did for her to help her better communicate. What did you notice? Pictures. Pictures are a great way to communicate because you can show someone a picture um, and it's, it's pretty easy to kind of decipher what that means. Um, what else? 
sign language? They can still hear, right? They can, well, yes, they can hear, but what they hear may be garbled. You So you could potentially when they were in therapy, you could train the brain to do things like that. Certain sounds mean certain things. Yeah. If they, you know, if you could get that across. Yeah. Um, also apps. So those that's another thing, apps, um, especially now with our technology. So let's talk about how we communicate with a few different types of people here. Um, okay. I don't feel like I really have to go into what communication is with you, but basically we're exchanging some sort of idea. So verbal is I say it. And nonverbal is my facial expressions, um, my body language, things like that. Which one do you think tells you the most about someone? Nonverbal. nonverbal tells you more than verbal typically. Okay, because I can say one thing, like when I talk to my husband, I'm like, no, I'm not mad. But he can tell I'm mad, right? Because what am I doing? I'm like, no, I'm not mad. I do that a lot. Um, <laughs> so nonverbal is going to tell you more than verbal does. Remember to follow along on your notes, too, and we'll go over the blanks. So we're on the second page, um, and your first question is, what is the difference between verbal and nonverbal? And the answer would be verbal is written, and nonverbal is facial expressions, gesture. Basically, it's or not written, spoken, sorry. Basically, uh, nonverbal is not. Page eight. No, we're starting with communication. So we will jump kind of back and forth. So we're on page eight. We're on the communication part. You see it now, Yvonne? All right, let's talk about some different types of populations. When we communicate with people, um, we have to remember that our patients, they do not have the medical terminology and the understanding that you or I would, okay, at that level. So if I go in and I say a lot of medical jargon, then um, that's, that's not going to do them any good. They're not going to comprehend what I say. 90% of your job, whether you're work, whatever you're doing in healthcare is education. You have to teach your patient what they need to be doing at home because they can't be in the hospital forever. You can't watch them forever, right? Um, so you're teaching them what they need to do to prevent this from happening again. So um, a lot of education is involved, okay? If you, and there's no blanks yet to fill in, I'll tell you when there are, um, how would you know, so let's say I have a patient who's diabetic and I have to teach them how to give themselves insulin. How would I know that I taught them and they grasp that concept? Did they do it? Can they do it? Not can they tell me how to do it, can they do it? I wanna see them do it, okay? Um, that's how I know that what I told them, they understood. How many times do you have to tell somebody something for them to get it? Yeah, I, I feel like, didn't, isn't there a study that said like 15 times or so you have to hear something that many times for you to actually be embedded in your brain? Are you going to remember every single thing I told you yeah, tomorrow? No, I wouldn't expect you to, right? That's why we have to keep going over it. Your patients are the same way. We'll watch that tomorrow. We're going to watch a clip from the resident, but we're going to do that tomorrow. Okay. Let's talk about visually impaired people. Let's talk about people who are just visually impaired first, not blind. Okay. I'm visually impaired. I have contacts. Okay. 
anybody who needs glasses or something, you have some sort of impairment in the eye area, right? Autumn, could you drive without your glasses? Okay. What about you, Yvonne? A little bit. Let's not take that chance. Um, so the same way that you or I, you know, can't see until we put our contacts or our glasses on, same thing with the patient. So if I go in there and I hand them a packet of information about diabetes and they don't even have their glasses on, did I accomplish anything? No, not really. Okay. Um, some things to think about. Turn the lights on. Okay, if it's dark in the room, turn the lights on so they can see. Put their glasses on. Um, large print is very beneficial. Now let's talk about somebody who's blind. Um, if someone's completely blind, what do you think you need to do before you go in the room? Please knock and let them know that you are there. And where are you in reference to them? Okay, and if you're sitting like a drink or ice or something, let them know where it is in reference to where they are, right? Um, you don't want somebody sneaking up on you, so don't, don't do that. You always want to tell them what you're doing before you do it. Hearing impaired. How many of you have grandparents who can't hear? Is that frustrating? What do you tend to do as they say, what? You get frustrated and you speak louder, right? Have you ever noticed yourself doing that? So true story, my husband claimed that I could not hear. He swore that my hearing was going back because every time he would say something to me, I couldn't hear. Doesn't matter the fact that he was upstairs and I was downstairs. So I said, okay, all right. So I went and I got a hearing test. I went to the ENT because he had me convinced I was like, there's something I had hearing loss. Okay. I don't have hearing loss. And I took my hearing test and I posted it on the fridge. My perfect score <laughs> hearing test. Um, but I will say that it's really frustrating on both ends because I couldn't hear him upstairs. And so that's frustrating because I'm like having to go upstairs or whatever. And if he would just come closer, I could hear and know what he was saying and it was frustrating on his end because he's like why in the world can't you hear me okay it's frustrating for both people um some things to think about it is extremely hard right now in healthcare to talk to these older adults who have hearing problems because you have a mask on and what do most of them do they read your lips it is so difficult for some people who are so hard of hearing speak slow Getting louder makes it worse. And you know, this sounds like common sense, but make sure their hearing aid is in. A lot of times they don't have their hearing aid in or the battery is dead or whatever. Make sure that you're making sure of those things. So I'm going to give you some scenarios and we're going to talk about maybe how you would handle them. So you're working at Sunnyview Rehab as a physical therapist. That should say your patient. Your patient was in an MVA where he suffered from a femur fracture and severe burns on his body. As you're getting ready to walk down the hallway, he tells you he doesn't want to walk because he's embarrassed by the way he looks. How would you respond? Let me tell you a few things before you even think about that. Number one, it is very beneficial and very important that patients get up and move. If they don't, there's a whole lot of other problems that can happen. We'll talk about that later. So our goal is we want him to walk. Okay. So what do you think? All right, go ahead. Offer him something to cover up the benefits so he doesn't feel self-conscious about it. Okay, like what? What do you think we could do? Uh, like gauze bandages or if it's like just on his legs, cover it up with gauze and then let him feel like hair pants or something. Okay, so... Meeting him halfway, making him feel more comfortable. What about a robe? Would that work? That would work. You should probably put a robe on your patient before you take him in the hallway anyway. True story. I did not realize this. I did have a little old man when I was working in the hospital. And we were walking down the hallway because we had to. And you know how gowns tie here? And then they tie right back here? Well... Apparently, he didn't have his hide by his butt. And I heard my nurse manager just, like, 
tackle. And I thought, what in the world? So I look and she's like motioning to me. His butt was out the whole hallway, like the whole hallway. So I was like, he didn't care. He didn't even know. But um, <laughs> that's not good. So put something on him. Yeah, we could, you know, try to, we're not going to say, well, okay, you don't have to walk today. Let's, let's try to kind of fix the problem. Um, you are an occupational therapist who's getting ready to assist Joanne with eating her lunch. As they bring her tray in, she notices that they have changed her diet to pureed food and thickened liquids. She tells you that she refuses to eat until she gets something from McDonald's. How would you respond? Before you go any further, pureed food is this. This is pureed food right here. Um, it's kind of put up in a blender and blend it all the way up. It makes it easier for people to swallow. So that's what she's having to eat. Um, if she doesn't eat that, it's dangerous. Um, she can choke, food can go into her lungs. So this is in her best interest. So what do you think you could say to her? Probably inform her of the risk of eating like other foods and explain why she has to eat that. Okay. Yeah, so that's a definite, and that's an educational piece that you have to go over and over and over again with people, okay? Is it also like an option to offer something that is safe for her that's from the family? What do you think? Could we do that? Yeah. yeah, we could put that McDonald's hamburger in a blender. We could do that. Okay, maybe the problem isn't the texture as much as what's on the plate. What are we blending up? Um, so maybe let's try to let's try to give her something else. Now, in a real world, I cannot leave my shift and run out to McDonald's. Okay, it's just not gonna happen. But maybe we can get our hamburger. Maybe we can try to meet her halfway there. Okay. So let's make sure we got all of our blanks. On page eight, the first blank is aphasia, the loss of ability to understand or express speech caused by brain damage. The second question is what does aspiration mean? And we're going to talk about that right now. Okay, um, we have to kind of review some anatomy before we go into this. So, you have your pharynx, which is your throat, and then you have a little flap of tissue that every time you eat and swallow, this flap of tissue covers your throat, so food goes down to the stomach and not the lungs. Do you know what that little piece of tissue is called? It starts with an E. Epiglottis. Epiglottis. Okay, the esophagus is the tube from which it goes down. The epiglottis is the flap. It's kind of like a trap door, and it covers every time you swallow, so it directs food down to the stomach where it's supposed to be and not to the lungs. Have you ever swallowed something too fast and choked? And you say, what? What do you say? It went down. Yeah, it literally did go down the wrong hole. Okay, um, so people with aspiration, it goes down the wrong hole all the time. Okay, and then that all that stuff that's not supposed to be in the lungs, it sits there and it grows bacteria and then you end up with some really nasty pneumonia. That's very hard to get rid of. The only way to fix the problem is to stop the aspiration. So, who's at risk for aspiration? Anyone with paralysis of this facial area. Okay, so we saw that woman right there. Um, on the first video we watched, we saw the, the droopy mouth, the slurred speech. They're at risk because their muscles to chew and swallow, they don't work, okay? Um, so those people are at risk. And what we have to do is a few different things. Um, mm -hmm. So if their muscles don't work, does that mean that they often receive it always open? It, um, sometimes, so doesn't necessarily mean it's all or nothing. It may be that the epiglottis works on occasion. So it's kind of a, it depends on how severe it is. So under your blank, what does aspiration mean? It basically means your epiglottis does not protect the lungs 
from anything you swallow. People at risk, brain injury, facial droop, slurred speech, older adults who choke frequently, they're all at risk. Like under anesthesia, right? Yeah, so right after anesthesia, you could be at risk as well. Yes. Isn't that just because, like, your body can just try to vomit sometimes if you eat before going under anesthesia? And then, since you have no way to defend yourself from it, it'll. That's one reason, it. yeah, um, because you can choke on your vomit. The other reason is anesthesia relaxes everything in your body, so that epiglottis is relaxed. Um, it depends on what type of anesthesia you've had. You know, like my daughter, she had surgery last week and she had like a short anesthesia. So right after surgery, she got to drink. But if you're having like a long term, you have to wait a little bit. Um, some things that we're going to do for this person. First of all, we are going to do speech therapy. So the first career that we're going to kind of talk about right now is speech pathologist. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever thought about doing that. It is a really good option for a career. It's in high demand. Any of these careers that we talk about are going to be in high demand because why? Who mostly gets these problems? Older adults. Do you have a lot of older adults? Yes, since the baby boom. Um, your grandparents' age, my parents' age, there's a lot of them. It's hard to find enough people who want to work in nursing homes. Okay. So there's a lot of demand. I have a question about the anesthesia thing. So what's like what's the difference in like how you like why would you have to be intubated versus like just giving them anesthesia? Um, it depends on how long you were under. Yeah, and what they are working on. Like if they're working on your mouth, then you have to be intubated to clear that be out of their way. It just depends. So if it's like a quick thirty minute thing, they may just put you to sleep with a gas mask. But if it's going to, you know, longer, more detailed, they, they have to intubate you to keep your airway open. Intubate is where they put a tube down to breathe for you. And then they take it back out. Um, so speech therapy, they, um, what they're going to do is they're going to teach exercises on how to strengthen these muscles here. They are going to be the ones that evaluate how well someone swallows, what type of diet would we put them on. Right now. The other things that we're going to do, in addition to speech therapy and exercises, is we're going to do something called thicken liquids and then a pureed diet. Um, Thickened liquids, we're actually going to do that tomorrow. Basically, you put this, it's like a cornstarch material, and it thickens everything you drink. And the idea behind it is the thicker it is, the more time you'll take to swallow. So it's a, it slows their swallowing down to prevent that aspiration. Pureed food, so like we put it in a blender, we soften it. Um, that is helpful because, again, it slows it down. It's not as hard to chew. It's easier to swallow. It helps with the aspiration. So the goal, obviously, is to stop the aspiration and prevent this pneumonia. That's what pneumonia looks like on an x-ray. Do you see all the cloudiness right here? So this right here is their lung, and then you see this white cloudy. That's pneumonia. So... I'm going to show you this video. They are called the dysphagia divas. Dysphagia is also another word for trouble swallowing. And um, they're going to show you how you would teach patients at home how to thicken liquids. So just to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. It's pretty gross. So... We're stopping here because there are two things I want to make sure that you do tonight. They're easy. You can probably even do them before you leave. Um, we are stopping on page nine on our notes. And we will start up again tomorrow. We will finish this.
and um, we will also do make some thickened liquids. So what I need you to do, and some of you have already done it and that's fine, is you're going to go to our Canvas page. You're going to go down and you're going to find the module called paperwork. Click on it. It's going to take you um, to, and you'll see assignment one and assignment two. Assignment one, you click on that link. It's a Google form. It's just like emergency info, stuff like that. You'll fill that out. Assignment two, when you click on it, it has a syllabus there. And then down at the bottom, you'll type your name to say, yes, I've seen it. And then your parents will type in their name. And then they can put any questions or whatever they have. They can put that there and submit. Okay, these two things done by 8.30 tomorrow morning, okay? And then we'll move on. Remember, if you are absent, you can go to the tab called Daily Instructions and click on the date and see what we did. And I think that is it.